probably notice on your programs. Air is spelled H-E-I-R. Murder's in the air. Get it? Yes, well, as I was saying. I was flattered when Mr. St. John contacted me and asked me to direct his play's premiere production. Actually, it was a work in progress, and he made changes and rewrites throughout the rehearsal period. While it was very exciting to be part of creating a brand new work, to tell the truth, he put quite the strain on me, the playwright, and the cast. She got that right. <laughs> Hush, Sam! Actually, should be unseen and unheard until the curtain opens. Sorry about that. The fact is, the cast and I are feeling a little nervous about the show because, well, it's not quite finished. Oh, don't worry, we're going to go on. The show must go on, as someone once said. I don't know who said it, but I'd love to get my hands around their neck. <laughs> anyway, as I was saying, the play is not quite finished. You see, it's a murder mystery, and most of the characters have great motives to kill, well, you'll see who. The thing is, Mr. St. John couldn't make up his mind which character should be the killer. In fact, he wrote several different endings in which the various suspects were revealed to be the murderer. We performed them all for him, and he still couldn't decide. As it got closer and closer to opening night, the tension in the air, that's A-I-R, grew so thick you could cut it with a knife. It got so bad that Mr. St. John had what I feel will, be, will prove to be a temporary breakdown. The reason he's not here with us tonight is because he's presently under heavy sedation in a very nice place, surrounded by soft walls and lots of padding. <laughs> the cast and crew and I are here, though, and we're determined to provide an entertaining show for you, even if it kills us. <laughs> that's, that's just a figure of speech, of course. This brings me to the main point of my being up here, to announce that you're going to have to help us. If you'll look in your programs, you'll see that we've inserted a loose slip of paper, a ballad of sorts. As you watch the first act, you'll discover which characters have a motive to kill someone, a person who will, indeed, be dead by the time the act ends. During intermission, we need you to check on your ballot which character you think is most likely to be the killer. Give your ballot to one of the ushers before you take a break for intermission. We'll tally them quickly, and for the second act, the cast will perform the scene that Mr. St. John wrote that has the character the majority of you choose as the murderer. At least, we hope that's what will happen. It got very confusing during rehearsals. It's no wonder we didn't kill the playwright. Quiet, Kyle! <laughs> um, look, we might as well get started. I saved myself a seat there near the front row, where I can follow along in script and help out if things get, um, shaky. Which they won't, but just in case. Are you ready, cast? Ready as we're gonna be. Then, um, let's do it. Places! Lights? <laughs> just through that doorway. You mustn't startle him. I'm sorry, Miss Weathers, but you startled me. My apologies, but I dare say a slight scare will do you no harm. However, a sudden shock to a man in his 90s in Mr. Starkweather's medical condition could prove fatal. Remember that, girl. Yes, ma'am. I guess this terrible storm has made me a little edgy. Yes, it is a tempestuous evening. I presume all the guests have been shown to their rooms? Yes, Miss Brothers. Well, all but Mr. Stark with his grandson, Mr. Simon III. It's a long drive from the college and a storm, you know. I hope we can start without him. It is already past Mr. Stark with his bedtime, and he must have his sleep. I assure you, Miss Brothers, the room is spotlessly clean. I certainly hope so. Mr. Starkweather's asthmatic condition makes the merest mode of dust potentially lethal. I served as Mr. Starkweather's housekeeper far many years before you came here, Miss Withers. I don't need you to tell me how to do my job. You brought the coffee? It's right here on the table, Mrs. Trent. Then go back to the kitchen and help Minerva with the rest of the refreshments. Yes, ma'am. Mr. Starkweather needs specific instructions that he wishes everyone present in the drawing room at 8 o'clock sharp. I'll ask Bensonhurst to fetch the guests from their rooms. Mr. Starkweather will be ready. I'm coming, Mr. Starkweather! I got all the cars parked in the garage like you told me. 
as I told you. Oh, I waste my breath. The dripping water all over the foyer. And how many times have I told you servants enter through the back door? Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. Benzahurst. Besides, it's, it's raining out there. I'm aware of that. Now it appears as if it has been raining in here, thanks to you. Oh, you're welcome. Go back out to where you came and maneuver yourself around to the back door. Do you think you can manage that? Oh, I don't know, but I suppose I can find out for you. <laughs> <laughs> when the final guest, young Mr. Simon, arrives, I shall summon you to park his car for him. Oh, good. And while I wait, I can see if I can go gifts. Don't be impertinent. How can I be when I don't know what his name? Just go into the kitchen and wait until I just call for you. The back door. Have you forgotten already? No, I just hope you have. <laughs> 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 That woman's an idiot. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Van Zandt informed me that Mrs. Stockerweather wished for all of us to be present. He wants the servants here. Precisely. Even Regina. Had I been informed of the fact soon, I would have summoned her to take a bath. She'd been out of the rain parking car, so I figured it might help. If you ask me, no, so flood would help. Be that, as, be that as it may, I shall summon her and Mrs. Trent. Why would Mr. Stockerweather want the servants to be here? I'll put out my crystal ball and let you know. Do you remember what I told you who came to work here? Yes, ma'am. Do as you're told and don't ask questions. Exactly! Stick to that! I will, Minerva. <laughs> oh dear, I never know what to wear on special occasions. I suppose Uncle Simon's inviting us here as a special occasion, isn't it, Jordan? I suppose so. When you consider most of the time he treats us like lepers. You think Uncle Simon treats us like jungle kids? Not lepers, mother. <coughs> lepers. Never mind. And don't worry. You look fine. Thank you, son. I'll tell you one thing. If we're ever in here at this mausoleum, the first thing we'll do is call up the Adam family and let them know what's on the market. Counting chickens, are we? Minerva, I didn't see you in your attractive young helper. Nancy is a nice girl, and I mean for her to stay that way. I'm sure I don't know what you mean. I doubt that. I don't understand. <laughs> I believe that. Miss Fiona, why don't you have a seat and we'll bring you a cup of coffee? Coffee? That sounds nice. It's a little damp in here. That's because it's a lot damp up there. <laughs> How do you take your coffee? Mother prefers hers black. I like mine sweet. I can flavor it myself. Whatever. Oh, a lovely Ostaburga! <laughs> You're looking very pretty tonight, Nancy. Thank you, sir. Sir? That makes me feel as old as Great Uncle Simon. Should call, call you Mr. Starkweiser the way a proper maid should. If anyone's to call you another name, it will be me. And you do not know, want to know which one I'm seeking. Minerva, you'll never change. Neither do you. More is with you. Now take a seat next to your mother. Yes, drill sergeant. My goodness, Daddy. Often stay and living out here in the boonies, away from restaurants and movies and shopping centers. Well, I get so depressed, I have to sit down and wait. It's not that bad, Paula. <coughs> I stay here during the week and go to my apartment in town most weekends. I am so relieved to hear that. I used to work for a large corporation before Mr. Starkweather hired me to be his personal secretary, and. Believe me, this position is much nicer. Look what we have here. Two rays of sunshine to dispel the gloom. You look beautiful, ladies. <laughs> I swear, Cousin Jordan, you're a rogue and a charmer. I do my best. Won't you join us? I see it over there. You'll be safer. <laughs> Thank you, Minerva. I take mine black. Love mine down with lots of cream, lots of 
cream and sugar, sugar. I must admit, I have an enormous sweet tooth. Maybe that's the cause of that god set of accent. <laughs> and how are you this evening, Cousin Fiona? What? Oh! I'm very well, <coughs> Paula. Well, isn't that just peachy? I swear, I don't know why we don't see more of one another. Seems like the only time we get together is for somebody's funeral. Well, aren't all funerals for somebody? <laughs> Shame on you. Oh don't be so morbid, Cousin Jordan. Well, at least this week is an exception to the rule. For once, no one's dead. So far, anyway. Oh, that's okay, honey. You didn't spill it. What did you mean by that? <coughs> oh, nothing. It's just that when you called to tell us that Great Uncle Simon wanted Mother and me to come to Stark by the mansion, I just, I assumed you were going to say he had passed on. You wish. I started to pack my new black dress. <coughs> it was a natural assumption, Mother. I mean, he's up in his years. He's in pretty bad health. I'm just relieved the old boy's still with us, of course. <laughs> Kathy, darling, I bet you know why Great Uncle Simon desired our presence on this frightful evening. Come on, tell. I believe Miss Van Zandt will go into the particulars, but I believe Mr. Starkweather wishes to discuss his will. Really? I'd appreciate it if you didn't drool on the others. You, you misjudged me, Minerva. I was surprised, that's all. Uh-huh. And where's Cousin Simon? Shouldn't he be here too? When I contacted him last week, he said he could make it. Apparently he's going to be late. And if he's tried to call you tonight, he couldn't get through. The phones are dead. Well, if we're going to discuss the will, Cousin Simon should be here too. He is Great Uncle Simon's own grandchild. And he'll probably get everything. Excuse me a minute. Uh, I hate to interrupt. You're doing great, guys. You really are. Um, folks, I suggested to Mr. St. John that these family relationships might be a bit confusing. He agreed and was going to write a scene that explained everything. He was working on it when he, uh, snapped like a rubber band. So I'll just tell you. I think the family tree might be in your programs, too. Here's the way it works. Simon Starkweather, the old billionaire who you'll meet shortly, married late in life and produced one son, Simon <coughs> Jr. Simon Jr., in turn, married and produced one heir, Simon III, the college student who's late for the gathering. The original Mrs. Starkweather, Simon II, and his wife are now deceased. Old Simon's, um, Simon's eldest brother, Paul, had a daughter, Bella, who married Lucy and Thompson, an Atlantic businessman, and they produced a daughter, Paula here. Paul, his wife, Bella, and Lucian are now deceased. Simon's yet younger brother, John, married and produced Ezra, who married Fiona here. And they had uh, Jordan. This is Jordan, but you know that already. Anyway, John, his wife, and Ezra are now deceased. I realize that's a lot of dead people, but had they all been included in the play too, the stage would have looked like a marching band had wandered into the living room and, believe me, it was hard enough to leave everyone about the stage as it was. At any rate, old Simon is Fiona's uncle by marriage, and is Jordan and Paula's great uncle. That makes Jordan, Paula, and young Simon cousins. Second or third cousins, I guess. I don't really know how that works. I hope this clears things up for you. Sorry for the interruption. Continue. We don't have a obvious notion where we are. I don't even know who I am anymore. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, resume with um, Kyle's and Rosalie's entrance. <clears throat> Jared. Huh. Give them their entrance cue. <laughs> what is it? He'll probably get everything. Who will? <laughs> Your cousin Jordan. I'm Simon. <laughs> OK, got it. And he'll probably get everything. <laughs> I'm very pleased with your investigation. I'll be glad to recommend you to my other clients. Just doing my job, Miss Van Zandt. Hello, everyone. 
I know we haven't all met yet, but I've got a pretty good idea who you all are. Mrs. Starkweather and her son Jordan, right? That's right, Mr. Davis. Call me Mike. From what Miss Vanziak said, you're some sort of investigator? You got it, pal. The private kind. <laughs> I see. Who is this nice young man, Dia? He's a detective, mother. A detective? <laughs> How exciting! <laughs> Do you know Jessica Fletcher? <laughs> <laughs> no, ma'am. She's way out of my league. I do know who you two ladies must be, though. Well, if you're a private investigator, I'd be surprised if you didn't. That accent settles it. You're Paula Thompson. You are 100% correct. I can't deny from the deep south. If she came from any deeper south, she'd be in the center of America. And that leaves you to be Kathy Collins. It's nice to finally meet you in person. The feeling's mutual, Mike. Uh, Mike and I have corresponded for some time through email and phone on Mr. Starkwood's behalf. The seat taken? No, no park it here. <laughs> now I expect you to remain unobtrusive. Oh yes, right after I find out what this means. Just go sit by the fire and keep quiet. Oh, by the fire? Good, <coughs> yes, I'll be back. Keep an eye on her. I shall do my best. If all is in readiness, Mr. Van Zandt, I shall inform Miss Withers to bring in Mr. Stark with it. Yes, thank you, Vincent Hurst. Is there a coffee if anybody else wants some? I could use some, Minerva. How do you take it? In a cup! Kissed him. <laughs> Black, please. Miss Van Zandt, I understand Great Uncle Simon has asked us here to talk about his will. This is correct. Frankly, I did not think it was a good idea. Mr. Starkweather's health is precarious at best, and he doesn't need this excitement. I advised him to communicate with you through mail, but he insisted on summoning you to Starkweather Mansion. I only hope he doesn't live to regret that decision. Miss Withers is bringing in Mrs. Starkweather to join us. Can I move now? Here you are, Mr. Starkweather. Go, go. I'll be right here if you need me. To think I was once surrounded by presidents and kings. Can my world have really shrunk to this? A meager staff of hired help and a handful of relatives. Simon, where's my grandson? We presume he's on his way, Mr. Starkweather. Can't wait for him. Not enough time anymore. Good evening, Great Uncle Simon. You're looking well. Are you blind, boy? Or just a <laughs> habitual liar? I was only making pleasantries, Uncle. Ah, save your breath. You've always been a smooth talker, Jordan, but that hasn't cut any ice with me. You're nothing but a greedy opportunist, boy. I have to know. I was one myself at your age. I guess it runs in the family, then. I guess you have a point. Well, Fiona, you look <laughs> the same. Wasn't necessarily to be a compliment. Great Uncle Simon, you're awful. At my age and with my money, I can afford to say exactly what I think. And how is my little Georgia Peach? A little old me? I'm just Peachy, Uncle. I'm Rachel. <laughs> Mr. Starkweather, would you care for a cup of coffee? He mustn't have any. The caffeine could keep him awake and it could affect his blood pressure. Sometimes his medications cause it to run a little high. Apparently I won't be having any. You heard my keeper, Minerva. Yes, sir. Everyone aspires to live to be a ripe old age. And for what? To be kept alive by medicines and machines? To be prevented from enjoying much of life's little pleasures, like a cup of coffee? You mustn't excite yourself, Mr. Starkweather. You see, I'm not even allowed to feel any strong emotion. <coughs> that is a bummer. Ah. <laughs> Put it very succinctly, Regina. I can have searched my entire vocabulary extensively and not come up with such an apt description. But I'm glad you like it. My doctors inform me that I won't have to remain a prisoner in this weak old body for much longer. 
There's just one thing I hate to leave behind. My money. You know what they say, Uncle. You can't take it with you. Yes, they do. And that's why several years ago I had Lois here draw up a will. I suppose you'd like to hear how I provide for you, my heirs. <coughs> I, for one, must admit I'm just a teensy bit curious. A teensy bit, eh? Ha! Here, Mrs. Stockmother, great people. See what you've done. Me? I'm Should good. somebody call an ambulance? We can't. The phones are dead. It's all right. He lost his breath. He just needs to breathe pure oxygen for a few moments. <laughs> Tell them. <laughs> Very well. <coughs> this is the will Mr. Starkmother was referring to. As you know, he's been a phenomenally successful businessman for many years. I'd say he's been on the cover of Forbes magazine at least a dozen times. I know all I did. He has the distinction of becoming one of the world's first billionaires. Twenty years ago, I begged dear Ezra to ask his uncle Simon to advise him on business investments. But he was too proud. Yeah, Dad had his pride. Lots of pride and very little money. If I may continue, Mr. Starkweather's fortune is now worth in the neighborhood of fifty billion dollars. Fifty billion? Oh, if I knew that, I would have asked for a raise. Oh. <laughs> well, Mr. Starkweather, I have no idea. I won't go into the details of the will, but it essentially bequeaths a million dollars each to his household staff. Mr. Bensonhurst, his butler, Mrs. Trent, his housekeeper, Minerva Walker, his cook, Miss Withers, his nurse, Nancy Fuller, his maid, and Regina Jones, his handywoman. <coughs> okay, Trace. <laughs> I have no idea. The will goes on to state that the rest of the money will be divided equally among his surviving relatives. They are his grandson, Simon III, his niece, Fiona Starkweather, and her son, Jordan, who will share one third, and his great niece, Paula Thompson. Is this good, nice? I always knew you'd do right by us, uncle. I knew you were mad when Mama buried a southern boy, Uncle, but the two of you must have been able to agree on one thing. Blood is thicker than water. I bet Miss Widows could tell you it's not. <laughs> <laughs> now that I've informed you of the contents of the will, I have another announcement to make. As of tomorrow, this will becomes invalid. What? Invalid? What? <laughs> what does invalid mean? <laughs> it means no good. I have a brother that's in <laughs> Miss Van Zandt means we're not going to get the money, you fool. That means I can't get TV with a big screen like I wanted. <laughs> sit. Sit. You too, Lois. Why did you decide to disinherit us, Michael? Found a better use of my money. That's why. Oh, I'm not cutting you out entirely. All of you in the old will will receive $50,000 each. 50000 out of $50 billion? Well, Lois advised me to be smart to leave you a little something. That way you'd be less likely to oppose my new will. New will? Yes. That's why I had Kathy over to start the mansion this weekend. Did I put up nice and legal for my signature? Mr. Davis here, as a disinterested party, can witness the signing, and Lois can file it at the courthouse come Monday. Mr. Davis said he's the detective. What did you hire him to do? Mr. Starkweather hired me to conduct an investigation on the quiet. For the past six months, I've flown to a dozen or more different foreign countries, checking out some of the world's most brilliant scientists, some well-known, Others who prefer to keep their experiments hush hush. I succeeded in finding one in Belgium. Let's call him Dr. X, who agreed to help Mr. Starkweather do what he desires, which is to clone himself. What? I don't understand! 
Good then, that's the only one. <laughs> Those bloody skin samples you had me prepare? The ones you said would be examined by specialists? They were examined by specialists, but there's specialists in DNA. I thought you were trying to find a cure. I was. Not a cure for my various ailments, but a cure for dying. And I did find it. Cloning? Precisely. Through modern science, I shall live forever! It's not right! That's neither here nor there. Let the moralists and politicians debate that question for decades to come. In the meantime, Dr. X, as Mr. Davis named him, will be creating a brand new me. Sit down, Withers! <laughs> the lot of you seem to be displeased. Not as suspect because of the moral question, but because of your changing fortune. It's too bad. Cloning is very expensive. Especially since the process I require must be done in absolute secrecy. But I will still have a sizable fortune for the new me to inherit. No doubt, I'll be the first person on Earth to become my own heir. <coughs> Withers, my blood pressure. Yes, Mr. Stark Withers. <coughs> Excuse me. I need to take Mr. Stark Withers' blood pressure. Why can't you take it right here? This is an outsized cuff made to go around a patient's thigh. You can stand the pressure from the inflated cuff there. Mr. Starkweather's had enough excitement for one evening. I shall put him to bed. <laughs> I guess our meeting is concluded then, unless anyone has any questions. Oh. I do. What the heck was that all about? <laughs> it's simple, Regina. Great Uncle Simon is going to leave all of fortune, but instead he changed his mind. He has decided to clone himself. Okay. Oh, what does clone? It means to take some cells from a person's body and use them to create a duplicate of the original. They can do that? Oh, that is great! When old Mr. Stockwater die, I can get a new job for new Mr. Stockwater. <laughs> the new Mr. Stockwater will have to be born and grow up. It goes against the laws of nature. How? It has all been arranged. Once Dr. X creates the new life, the new cells will be implanted into a host mother who will carry the child to term. Host mother? <coughs> who? Me. Me, 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 I mean, why not? I'm young and healthy. I'd be a good mother for a little sorry and sorry. <laughs> How could you consider being part of this, this travesty? Because I'll be well compensated. Besides, have you ever met anyone give birth to a baby billionaire? <laughs> Uncle Simon giving his money to a baby? <laughs> in a manner of speaking, yes. The new will places Mr. Starkweather's fortune into a trust fund, which I'll administer. I'll release the money to pay Dr. X and his staff to perform the cloning procedure. After that, ample funds will be available to provide for Kathy's needs and the child's upbringing and education. Once the child's born, grown and properly trained to deal in high finance, the fortune will be turned over to him. The kid will look, think, and act like Simon Starkweather. He could conceivably parlay those billions into trillions by the time he's an old man. But for what purpose? To leave it to another clone, and another, and another? Where will it end? When there's a Simon Starkweather with enough power and money to rule the world? We didn't discuss it, but you might well be right. How can you condone to such madness? Oh, I see why she would. Miss Van Zandt and the Collins girl would have like billions after billions after Mr. Starkweather's money. Money that should have gone to us. And his family. <laughs> I guess you're going to refuse since you're part of this scheme. Not me. I did the job I was paid to do. My part is over. I'll take my very generous check and head home. Frankly, I don't care if the boss's science fiction experiment works or not. You should be ashamed. You all should be ashamed. I believe you made your feelings quite clear. If you and the others would join me in the kitchen, I wish to have a word with you. We'll clear up your I trust you'll ring if you require anything else. 
The North might be kind of nice here and check out half a little peek of a house. Oh, shut up, Rodriga! <laughs> Kathy and I will retire to my room. You might as well begin typing up that new old tonight. I'll direct you how to put everything into proper legal terms. Sure, Lois. The sooner this is finished and signed, the better. Hey, wait a minute. Why didn't anyone ask me if I wanted to carry the baby? I can do it as well as she can. You're Mr. Starkweather's blood kin, Paula. It wouldn't be proper. Well, I guess it would be kind of tacky. Proper? You're about to conduct an experiment that makes Frankenstein look like an amateur. And you're worried about being proper. Cool it, kid, before you burst the blood vessel. Now, Mr. Starkweather has made up his mind. Something tells me that whatever the old man wants, he gets. Succinctly put, Mr. Davis. Kathy? I'll go upstairs to my room and pack. Once I witness the signing of the new will tomorrow, I won't have any reason to stick around. Good night. <coughs> We were robbed. What? Yes, mother. Jacob was fortunate to of our and snatched it away. That was me. Me? The man's a monster. He enjoyed pulling the rug from under our feet. Well, at least he is leaving us 50,000. To him, that's no more than tossing a dime to a beggar. He's just doing it so we don't contest a new will. You heard him. Yeah. I wish he were dead. I wish that old goat would drop dead tonight. It would serve him right. If Uncle Simon did die tonight, then we'd get all of our money, wouldn't we, my dears? Would anyone care if I gave up rich? <laughs> That's all I can afford to pay now. Mr. Starkweather. It's Jordan, remember? At least when Minerva the Dragon Lady isn't around. I thought everyone had gone to bed. I was going to turn in, but I had nerves for a midnight snack. I'll fix you something. Oh, never mind that. What are you doing, though? Mrs. Trent sent me to make sure the fire screen was properly closed and the sparks popped on together. And burn Starkweather Mansion to the ground? Maybe that wouldn't be such a bad idea. You shouldn't talk like that. You know Mr. Starkweather's an invalid. How could he... You read my mind. Jordan. I got you to call me by my first name. You mustn't even suggest such a thing. It's wicked. Why should that surprise you? Everyone knows I'm the black sheep of the family. If it were to happen tonight, you'd have a million, and I'd have billions. Think of the good times we've had together. Don't. It's a tempting thought. Admit it. No, it's not. It's a horrible idea. Which part? The part about the money? Or are you and I together? Well, the part about the money. And what about us? I, I, Nancy! Oh, oh. <laughs> Jesus. I thought you were going to help me with dishes. <laughs> I was just checking the next door uh, to make sure they're locked. <laughs> and what are you doing here? I, I had an urge for a snack and saw Nancy. I decided to chat. That appetite of yours is going to get you into trouble one of these days. Minerva, what are you doing with that knife? Minting onions. At midnight? <laughs> I can't stand having anyone see me cry. Mm -hmm. I thought I heard someone in here came to check. If you're hungry, you come with me. I'll find you something. Yes, Minerva. Anything you say, Minerva. Finish checking, then come give me a hand. Come on! <laughs> Regina! <laughs> Thought I heard someone come in. Oh, it's just me. So I see. Good grief, woman. What are you doing with that hatchet? Oh, I was outside chopping wood for the fire this afternoon before it stopped raining, and I forgot where I put it. I've been forgetting a lot of things lately. <laughs> when I remember where I put 
it, I figured I'd bring it inside to dry it off so it did no guys. That's fine, but why bring it into the living room? And how many times have I told you? Servants into through the back room. Oh, as many as you want. I'm a count. <laughs> I swear, Regina, it will be the death of me yet. Go into the kitchen and get the towel from Mrs. Trent. I'm not wet. This is no raining. I know. Well, the hatchet. Oh, all right. The back door. <laughs> that woman had a brain. She'd be dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> a penny for your thoughts. Jordan, I'm out for a breath of fresh air. What are you doing up so late? Munchies. Want a cookie? No, thanks. So did you and Miss Van Zandt finish that new will? Everything's finished except for Mr. Starkweather's signature. I see you've come down, I wouldn't be surprised if you hated me. Why should I hate you? I'd make the same deal if I were in your shoes. Sure you would, Jordan. Minerva was right. Being the mother of two little Simon would be the next best thing to owning the billions yourself. Aren't you forgetting something, though? What? Little Tiger needed dad, too. Someone to guide him and mold him into the perfect rep for <coughs> great uncle Simon. A heartless money-making machine. You think so? I know so. And who would be a better father figure than I? You're a very attractive woman, Kathy. We can mix business with pleasure. Take your crummy hands off me! What? You're getting cookie crumbs on my blouse! <laughs> <laughs> and, by the way, if I decide little Simon needs a father when he's born, I'll pick a suitable husband then. Not some sleazy, money-hungry slimeball like you, Jordan! I can kill you, you witch! I'd like to see you try. Not with a detective in the house. Aren't you finished in here yet? I need to make everything all right. Well, hurry up, girl. We never want you in the kitchen. Yes, ma'am. Don't dawdle. Someone left the French doors open. <coughs> Might as well close them. Miss Thompson. <coughs> <laughs> Mrs. Trent, you're giving me a fry. I suppose I should be grateful you didn't shoot me. What on earth are you doing, roaming around the house in the middle of the night with a gun in your hand? Oh, don't worry. I know how to handle a gun. I, uh, couldn't sleep, so I thought I'd clean it. I was going down to the kitchen to look for some oil. I doubt you'll find what you're looking for unless you want to rub it with Crisco. Do you carry that thing often with you? I take it everywhere I go. Daddy taught me to be a crack shot when I was 10. A girl can't be too careful. I, think, I don't think you'll have anything to worry about at Starkweather Mansions. Miles away from the nearest town and no one ever comes out this way. You've never had a burglary? Or a prowler? No. Well, it's a wonder with Great Uncle Simon being so simple. I mean, all you'd have to do is break in those French doors, walk right on into his room and do who knows what. <coughs> like a shooter? It could happen, as awful as that thought is. In his condition, how could he defend himself? He could always sick Nurse Withers on him, I suppose. That would frighten away any intruder. <laughs> Where does she sleep? In the room beyond Mr. Starkweather's. <clears throat> so she can hear him ring his bell for her in the night. Now, I remember from when Mama brought me here when I was a little girl. That room used to be the library, and the one beyond it the parlor. Am I right? That's correct. When Mr. Starkweather became too ill to go up and down the stairs, the library was converted into a bedroom, and Withers took the parlor. So they're the only ones that sleep downstairs? Yes. The servants' quarters are upstairs, in the attic, under the house. <coughs> we have our own staircase to the kitchen. Why do you ask? Oh, just curious. Excuse me, folks. 
I thought that little section of dialogue was kind of awkward and suggested to Mr. St. John that he cut it. But he felt that you needed to get an idea of the layout of the house. He said, what do you want me to do? Put a blueprint of Starkweather Mansion in the program? Which I thought was kind of rude. He insisted I leave the dialogue in, so I did. But it's a bad piece of writing, and I want you to know that I tried to correct it. That's all. <laughs> I want you to know that if you do that again, you're gonna have to come up here with that script and play Mrs. Trent yourself. Sorry, sorry. Wow, that was great. I wish I had your hair. Uh, where were we again? <clears throat> so you were curious about the layout of the house, were you? Yeah, just curious. <laughs> well, you know what they say. Curiosity killed the cat. Yes, well, if you'll excuse me, I'm going to my room. <clears throat> Wouldn't it be ironic if someone did break it tonight? Of all nights, and... This is Dr. Speed up one's heart rate? Oh yes, my little heart is just pump pump pumping away! <coughs> well, perhaps a single dose that shall be a, I presume an overdose would be fatal? Extremely fatal. Or am I being redundant? I so suppose fatal is fatal, just like dead is dead. Don't you agree? Completely. One cannot be deader than someone else. Dead long, perhaps, but that's the only comparison that comes to mind. Might I inquire why you brought your medication into the living room? Why? That's a very good question. Why did I bring them down here? Oh, I remember! I was going to show them to Miss Withers and see if she could give me any free samples with her medical connections, you know. Well... But it looks as if your bottle is full already. Y yes, it was, but it doesn't hurt to plan ahead. We better gather our mind. Allow me to assist you. Like a pigeon pecking popcorn! <laughs> Where? Your left knee. Left kneecap. Oh, got it! They roll just everywhere! Round objects tend to do that, madam. Miss Willows! Oh, Starkweather, what are you doing on the floor with Benson first? <laughs> <laughs> Picking up spilled pills. Watch where you put your feet, my dear. Both of them. Wasn't there a question you had for Miss Withers? <coughs> Was there? The digitalis? Oh, yes. Miss Withers, I was wondering if you had any manufacturer's samples of digitalis you don't need. I have a heart condition and like to keep a supply handy. I can see why you would. <laughs> Yours tend to run out, don't they? I'm sorry, Mrs. Starkweather, but I'm fresh out of spare drugs. Your uncle requires every pill he's got to keep him going. Oh my, well then we better gather our minds, shouldn't we? Would you help us, my dear? I suppose. Is this a uh, private game, or can anybody play? <laughs> I thought you were holding a tiny little marble tournament. All packed. Let me give you these, Mrs. Starkweather. I really must return to my duties. Thank you, I might as well. Thank you. Thank you from the bottom of my heart. Miss Withers, <coughs> how's the boss? Bossy. He sent me for a pitcher of fresh drinking water. If I'm not back in a minute, start ringing that handbell for me. See what I mean? Come in, Mr. Starkweather! I gather he rings for you a lot? Incessantly. When he stops ringing that bell, I'll know he's kicked the bucket. Excuse me. Spoken like a true member of the medical profession. What's with the work, Bensonhurst? Got some kind of problem I can give you a hand with? Thank you, but no. 
digital ways, I have to excuse myself. Well? You're up kind of late, Mrs. Starkweather. I couldn't sleep. What about you, Mr. Davis? Oh, I'm a real night owl. Besides, I was hoping the young Simon Starkweather would show up. I haven't met him yet. Simon's a sweet boy. I do hope he's all right with the storm and all. He might have pulled off the road to let it pass. It's starting to cloud over again. We could be in for another deluge. Oh dear, I hope not. Well, I think I'll go back to my room and lie down. Good night again, Mrs. Starkweather. Good night. Coming, Mr. Starkweather. Oh, you're still here. Yeah, just uh, keeping an eye on things. I see. Well, my patient. You're up too, Mr. Davis. Yeah, and I'm not the only one. There seems to be more traffic passing through Starkweather Mansion at midnight than goes down the interstate at rush hour. I know what you mean. I've been hearing footsteps past my door all evening. I'm not surprised, though. We could have guessed that Mr. Starkweather's announcement would give his heirs a sleepless night or two. <laughs> Between us, Miss Van Zandt, this <coughs> cloning business, how do you feel about it? I'm a lawyer, Mr. Davis. I'm paid to think, not feel. Could Mr. Starkweather be cloned? Definitely. There's no question that technology exists. Should he be cloned? Let's just say I wouldn't want to be the first to challenge nature by creating another Lois Van Sant. <laughs> Me too. I'm a simple guy. I've got enough to deal with in one lifetime. I know that the sooner we get the will signed and I can get back to the real world, the better. The new will is finished. Mr. Starkweather can sign it first thing in the morning. The old boy's still awake. His nurse was in here a few minutes ago. I heard him ringing his bell for her. In that case, there's no reason he can't sign it now. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. The people in this house are as tense as a bunch of long-tailed cats in a room full of rocking chairs. I know I'll feel much better once the boss's plan is a done deal. I'll go up and do your will. Why don't you let Mr. Starkweather know? What in the world? The circuit breaker must have tripped. But the storm passed hours ago. I know. I don't like this. I don't like this at all. I'll find Bensonhurst and have him show me where the main breaker is. Good. I'll tell Mr. Starkweather to take care of it. Tools of the trade. It's all right, Mr. Starkweather. I'll... Hello? Is anyone here? Benson Hers? Mrs. Trent? Anybody? Kathy, I think there's something wrong with Mr. Starkweather. I don't know where that nurse is. Oh no, he hasn't signed the will yet, has he? I don't think so. Perhaps he just fainted. We need light. Mr. Davis is trying to... <gasps> what happened? Someone struck me. It's Mr. Starkweather! Help him! I heard a scream. <laughs> He's dead. Someone put the blood pressure cuff around his neck and pumped it up to the maximum. 300 millimeters of mercury. Mr. Starkweather has been strangled to death. Poor Mr. Starkweather. Who could have done such a thing? Oh, give me a break. I'd say you and nearly everyone else in this room are right up there on the top ten list. Excuse me. Hold it down. Let me check the body. Those straps are on his rope. Is it blood? I'm not sure. Well, what else could it be? I'll handle it. I'm the detective, remember? What can you tell us, Miss Withers? After I brought Mr. Starkweather the pitcher of drinking water and made sure he was breathing all right, I went to my room and laid across my bed. A few minutes later, the lights went out. I noticed that clue. Hush! <laughs> I was lighting a candle when Mr. Starkweather started ringing his bell. I must have been hit with a heavy object. When I came to, the lights were on and... Yeah, we can take it from there. You seem to be in charge, Mr. Davis. What do we do now? We keep trying the phones until we can get through to the cops. If the lines aren't up by morning, someone will have to drive into town and report that there has been a murder <coughs> at Starkweather Mansion. Murder? 
<laughs> Maybe the old man doesn't have soft hair. <laughs> Maybe not. <laughs> <laughs> Wasn't that the most diabolical murder you ever saw? Don't you just love it? The way Mr. St. John's mind works, it's no wonder he went bonkers. Now remember, first thing during the intermission, we need you to get your ballots from your programs and mark the suspect you think murdered Simon Stark. The ushers will circulate in the lobby and collect them up in here as well. In case any of you don't need to, um, Go for a drink of water or anything. Well, see you in 15 minutes. Here is the murderer. Lines are actions that are clues to that person's identity. The cast will work these into the show. I wanted you to know so that you can continue to play armchair detective and try and guess the culprit's identity. Well, that's everything for now. Relax and um, enjoy the conclusion of Murders in the Air. Dead. I can't believe Grandfather is dead. Well, he is Cousin Simon. He's the deadest person I ever saw. Funny you should say that. Benson was and I were discussing the degrees of dead earlier, and... Mother, please. <laughs> and he was murdered. There's no doubt about it. We saw the body. Poor Grandfather. If I could have gotten here sooner, just... How would we know you didn't get here sooner? What? For all we know, you could have arrived hours ago. Parked your car somewhere out of sight, then slept inside and killed the lights moments before you killed Simon Starkweather. That's ridiculous. Why would I kill him? I'd say a third of a $50 billion fortune is enough to knock somebody off. If Mr. Starkweather had signed a new will. But I didn't know about the new will. I wasn't here when Grandfather revealed his crazy clone scheme you told me about. It would have been easy enough to hide outside the French doors and eavesdrop on the conversation. Why would I hide? I was expected here. I already told you what happened. Tell me again. All right. I had to creep at a snail's pace on that long country road from town. The wind was lashing the windshield so hard I could barely see. The wind was ripping branches off trees and flinging them against the car. It's like driving through a hurricane. When I came upon the old wooden bridge that spans the stream that surrounds the estate, I had to stop. The stream had turned into a raging river, and the old bridge had been destroyed. I remembered about a mile from there, there was a tree that had fallen across the stream many years ago. I used to play when I was a kid. I found the old tree, and I made my way across it, even though the rising water had almost covered the trunk. Apparently, I got here just after Grandfather had been murdered. It's a nice story, but it sounds rehearsed. It's not nearly enough. It's the truth. I swear it. Maybe. But I'm still not crossing you off my suspect list. Yeah. And just, who else is on that list, Mr. Davis? <coughs> Everyone else in this house except for Miss Van Zant and Miss Collins. They had a heck of a lot to gain if your grandfather had stayed alive only a few more minutes. As it turns out, they're left out in the cold. Especially me. Lois has other clients. Now I'm among the unemployed. Captain, <coughs> relax. I'm sure once the estate is settled, we can arrange for you to be paid a generous seventh check. Take it out of your portion if you'd like. Mother and I will pass. So, uh, nothing personal, of course. Of course. <clears throat> so, Mr. Davis, what do you suggest we do now? <clears throat> Simon's story reminded me we could play some bridge! <laughs> <laughs> the way I see it, we sit tight until daybreak. I'll have you show me the way to your car and drive me into town. I'll report what I know to the cops and we'll notify them that the bridge is out. My guess is they'll fly in by helicopter. They'll need to get the body down to the coroner's office, examine the crime scene, and take everyone's statements. Once a homicide detective is assigned to the case, I'm out of here. But you're a detective. And you were here when the murder happened. You have a better chance of solving it than anyone else does. Sorry, but now that the boss is dead, I'm off the payroll. I'll hire you to stay. I won't have my money until I'm paid my portion of the inheritance, but if you're willing to stay... You're on, kid. I figure you're good for the dough. 
Incidentally, that offer just dropped you to the bottom of my suspect list. Well, might as well start earning my salary. How can we help, Mr. Davis? First, I want to question everyone as to their whereabouts when Mr. Starkweather was murdered. Establish everyone's alibis. Yeah. <coughs> also, I need to know anything all of you in the staff might have seen or heard in the last few hours that might lead us to discover the killer's identity. Clues. You got it. Motives, alibis, and clues. That's what a detective has to work with. The motives in this case are obvious. The other elements aren't yet, but hopefully they will be by the time I'm finished. Sounds like a good plan to me. Who should we start with, Mr. Davis? Since you're paying the freight, call me Mike. And how about you, Miss Thompson? Do you mind being first? I'm awfully tired, but if I have to... You don't have to, Paula. None of us do. What do you mean, Dad? I mean, Davis isn't a police officer. We don't have to tell him the time of day. But why would you refuse to cooperate, Jordan? Unless, of course, you had something to hide. Now look, Simon, don't start accusing me of murder unless you can prove it. Simon has a point. Do you want me to tell the police that everyone cooperated except you? All right, I'll answer your dumb questions. But first, I'm going to take Mother upstairs. She's getting up in her ears and needs her rest. Why, thank you very much, Jordan! <laughs> I may not be a spring chicken anymore, but that doesn't mean I'm Mrs. Methuselah either! <laughs> Don't get excited. Are you okay? Do you need your dinner, Charles? No, but if I did, I'm sure there's still one or two pills under the sofa. <laughs> I had a little accident with my co-op. Come on, you can call us when you're ready for us. I assume you'll want to question everyone in private. You can wait with me in my room if you like, Kathy. I want to read over that old will again, since it will remain the official one. Sure, Lois. Excuse us. I'd like to stay since I wasn't here earlier. I feel as if hearing all the statements might give me a better idea of what exactly happened tonight at Starkweather Mansion. You're the boss now. I'm particularly interested in what happened between the time that Mr. Starkweather said he was changing his will and the time his body was discovered. And how long was that? Several hours. Well, Miss Thompson, did you observe anything which occurred in that time frame that might help us? I was very disappointed by Great Uncle Simon's announcement, as you might well imagine. I mean, I can understand, understand wanting to clone Brad Pitt, but Great Uncle Simon? <laughs> No offense, Cousin Simon, but your grandfather was not a very nice person. Anyway, I spent the majority of that time in my room. I did come downstairs once on uh, a little air. I was outside of the kitchen when I heard Minerva and that cute little maid Nancy talking. What's the matter with you, girl? Did you leave your mind in the other room? You haven't heard a word I said. I'm sorry, Minerva. <coughs> I'm so confused. How about what? Has that no good scamp Jordan been bothering you again? Jordan? I mean, Mr. Starkweather. What makes you think that? When I walked in on the two of you in the living room, you were standing mighty close together. We are lovey dovey like. <laughs> what was he saying? I think he wanted me to... To do something you didn't want to do? Yes, but it's not what you're thinking. That boy better not try anything. If he does, I cut him down to size. Nerva. No. He's not interested in me. I heard him with Miss Collins. Ah, I can see a picture. When you lost your millions, you lost interest in me. <coughs> He's going the money right to the Collins girl. He proposed to her, but she laughed at me. Good for her. Serves him right, that lazy bum. Don't call him that. Ah, you're not on him, aren't you? Don't be fooled, Nancy. Jordan will just use you and toss you aside like he's done dozens of the girls I know of. Well, maybe he's ready to settle down now. If Mr. Starkweather had changed his will, Jordan would be free to, free to do what? Nothing. If we're finished, <coughs> now I can go now. Go on. Nancy. Yes, ma'am? Lock your door. Excuse me. That little scene in the foyer was a flashback. It showed a conversation Paula overheard before the murder. The other characters' stories, well, portions of them, will be shown in flashback too. Isn't that clever? I just wanted to make sure you got that. Well, she's really asking for it. <coughs> uh, so tell me, Mrs. Trent, 
Did you see or hear anything suspicious earlier tonight before Mr. Starkweather was murdered? Suspicious? Well, I suppose you'd call toting a gun around the house suspicious, even though Mr. Starkweather wasn't shot to death. A gun? Who has a gun? Besides me? Paula Thompson, that's who. Claims she's a regular Annie Oakley. And she did mention just how easily it would be for someone to walk through those French doors and kill Mr. Starkweather. Did she now? Ask her yourself. Anything else? I did happen to overhear a rather odd conversation between Regina and Mrs. Starkweather. I had gone upstairs to distribute candles to everyone in case of a power failure, which turned out to be very useful, as you know. I was turning the corridor into the west wing when I saw Mrs. Starkweather at the far end near the stairs. Do I have enough? Oh dear. Oh, Miss Starkweather! <laughs> until Miss Willis came out. It was apparent her unexpected appearance startled Master Jordan. Well, what do you want? I, uh, I was going to check on Great Uncle Simon. No need, that's what I'm paid to do. How is he? Still breathing, if that's what you're wondering about. How much time do you think he has left, Miss Withers? Let's just say you need to start reading any long novels. Or even a short story. But do you think he'll make it through the night? I think Mr. Starkweather will keep his heart beating through sheer determination. Long enough to sign that new will. That is what you wanted to know, isn't it? You misjudge me, Miss Withers. Give it a rest, Jordan. You'd love to see him drop dead before daybreak, just like nearly everyone else in this house. Including you. A million dollars is a fortune. A lot of people would kill for that money. If that's a hint, forget it. As Mr. Starkweather's nurse, I'd be the prime suspect if his death appeared to be anything but by natural causes. Suspecting and proving are two different things. I'm going to forget that you said that. Good night, Jordan. It's true. Jordan Starkweather did hint that I was in a position to end his great uncle's life in a way that would appear natural. 
I assume Benson Hurst also told you that I refused. He did, but you could have changed your mind. And then killed him with the blood pressure cuff? That would have been foolish. Hardly what you'd call by natural causes. I agree. The manner by which he was murdered makes no sense at all, whoever did it. It's as if the killer was flaunting the deed in our faces. Why would they do that? That's a good question. <coughs> Tell me, Miss Withers, if you had to pick someone to be a uh, murderer, who would it be? Off the record. That Thompson girl, his great niece, is too goody-goody for my tastes. Oh, those southern girls can pour in their charm when they want to. But Scarlett O'Hara is pretty ruthless when you get down to it. We do know that Cousin Paula has a gun. See what I mean? I dare say that she and Jordan both were desperate to get their hands on Mr. Stuck with his billions. I overheard the talk <laughs> earlier this evening. It was shortly after Miss Van Zandt's announcement about the new will. They didn't notice me in the cold war. <laughs> well, what can we do? Do? What can we do? It's out of our hands. Don't be such a wimp, Cousin Jordan. That money rightfully belongs to us. There has to be a way to get our hands on it. I know. Maybe we can have Great Uncle Simon declared insane. I've thought of that, but it won't work. If cloning was just a wild theory, we could, but it isn't. It's been done. Great Uncle Simon's plan to be the first person to clone himself may be bizarre, but not insane. We'd lose the case. Yeah, and we'd probably spend the pittance we're going to inherit on the lawyers. Like that Miss Van Zandt. She... What? What are you thinking? I'm thinking, if you can't beat them, join them. <laughs> huh? I just thought of a way for Miss Van Zandt to put me on her team. What is it? Fend for yourself, Jordan. If you'll excuse me, I've got to talk to that lawyer. If you can't beat them... Oh yeah. Where would Kathy be? <coughs> it's true. Jordan did suggest we get married. It wasn't what you'd call a romantic proposal. It's more like a business proposition. We're going to have access to billions. What did Jordan have to offer you? Himself, I guess. In my opinion, that fortune hunter wouldn't be worth two cents. Then you did turn him down? Jordan is attractive in a smarmy way, but any woman who married him would be a fool, and believe me, Mike, I'm no fool. I knew that from the time we started working together. <coughs> You're smart enough to volunteer to carry Grandfather's clone. Look, Simon, once Mr. <coughs> Starkweather made his mind up about cloning himself, nothing was going to change it. He was going to find a surrogate mother somewhere. It might as well have been me. Suppose. <laughs> I just find the whole idea creepy. You're a lot nicer about it than the other is worth. For example? Paula Thompson. She hadn't given up hopes of getting her hands on Mr. Starkweather's money. How can you tell? I was in Lois's room with her when Paula knocked on her door. She asked to speak to Lois in private. Lois went with her. I, she didn't close the door, so I couldn't help but overhear the conversation. We're very busy, Miss Thompson. Preparing that new will? Yes. Miss Van Zandt, you're a lawyer. Are you sure this cloning business is legal? You could lose your license to punish you if... The process will be performed in Belgium, as we told you. Our laws don't apply there. What about ethics? Haven't lawyers been disbarred before for behavior that was unethical, if not illegal? What's your point? I want it on. You can pay me from that baby's trust fund to be the nanny or whatever. I don't care what you name the position. If you refuse, I shall be forced to report you to the Bar Association. Isn't that what you call it? It is. Let me give you a little free legal advice, Miss Thompson. In the first place, if you make any accusations against me before the cloning procedure is completed successfully, I'll sue you for the 50000 you're due to receive and everything else you own, and I'll get it. In the second place, once the baby's on the way, I plan to close down my office. I shall devote all my time to Kathy and little Simon's care. At that point, it won't bother me in the least if I should be disbarred. You don't have to be a lawyer to administer an estate. Anyone can do it. Oh. So you see, young woman, your threats are meaningless. In fact, as an officer of the court, I should report 
put your feeble attempt at extortion to the police. I did save it. Take your silly southern self out of my sight and I might be willing to forget it. Oh, all right. Oh, <coughs> you, you lawyer. Excuse me. <coughs> yes, Mrs. Trent? I found what's left of the Christmas candles I stored away. I thought it would be a good idea to pass them out in case of a power failure. I suggest you take one and keep some matches nearby. That's very thoughtful. Thank you. Kathy's in my room. I'll take one for her also. Miss Thompson? Oh, all right. I'm going to my room. There's something there I need to get. What's the matter with her? Let's just say she's a poor loser. Miss Thompson played her ace and I trumped it, in a manner of speaking. I'll give this to Kathy. If I remember correctly, when Kathy saw Mr. Starkweather's body and screamed, you ran in through the front door. What had you been doing outside, Regina? I was outside? <laughs> oh, yes, I was. I was borrowing TV from a guest room. You heard why, Regina? You did? Oh, new sure travels fast around here. Yeah, all the actors on your set were green? Sure was. It looked like Martians had landed or something. <laughs> When I hooked up the new TV set, the picture was still no good. Everyone was, was fuzzy like a woolly worm. I went outside to turn antenna around. On the roof? Well, it wouldn't do much good to do it in the basement now, would it? <laughs> <laughs> I went to go get tall ladder out of shed when I heard the gal scream bloody murder. Murder, even though it wasn't bloody. <laughs> Did you see or hear anything outside? Um, I saw a owl and I heard some frog. Human. <laughs> Human. Oh. I saw Mr. Jordan out on the patio when I was coming in, but I don't know why he was out there. Earlier tonight, Regina, did you hear anyone talking about the new will? Oh, who was it? Minerva and Vincent Hurst didn't talk about much else. They were going on about it in the kitchen before Mr. Starkweather croaked. Gina, focus. What were they saying? That is no fair, that's what. They have worked for Mr. Starkweather all these years, and they deserve the millions. Me, I don't care too much. I figured 50000 to get me a new TV with a big screen. <laughs> now I might get two. Benson, Hurst, and Minerva? Oh, yeah. The more Minerva thought about it, the madder she got in. That woman has got a temper. She was ready to storm in Mr. Starkweather's room and give him a piece of her mind. You wasn't going to, Minerva. Who's going to stop me? I shall, if necessary. You and whose army? I completely agree with you. We were wrong. <coughs> but a confrontation is not the answer. Oh, yeah? Then what is? Have patience. Mrs. Starkweather had not signed the new will yet. Perhaps I'll change his mind by morning. We should live so long. No, Minerva. He should live so long. So, what were you doing outside about the time of the murder, Mr. Starkweather? I was just getting a breath of fresh air. Anything wrong with that? Not if you remained outside. What do you mean? When I made a cursory examination of the crime scene, I noticed that Miss Withers left the window open a couple of inches to let some of that fresh air in. Anyone could have climbed in and... Are you accusing me of killing Great Uncle Simon? Calm down, Mr. Starkweather. I'm not accusing anyone. <coughs> yet. Besides, from what we've heard, Jordan, conning people into doing your bidding seems to be part of your style. Who told you that? I'll ask the questions if you don't mind. I repeat, what were you doing outside? If you must know, <coughs> Kathy and I had a disagreement and I blew up. I went outside to cool off. Anything, or have you already heard about that? I question, you answer. Remember? <laughs> Let me ask you this then. If you didn't kill Simon Starkweather, who do you think did? <coughs> Look, I'm not saying she did it, but have you talked to that little maid, Nancy? Why her, Jordan? The girl has a crush on me. I flirt with a lot of girls, but I did nothing to lead her on. <laughs> I knew she'd be upset about the new will. Not that she'd lose her money, that I'd, I'd lose even more. 
I strolled out in the house and was outside the kitchen when I overheard Nancy talking to Miss Withers. Can I do something for you, Miss Withers? I needed fresh water to provide Mr. Stark with his bedtime. I got it. That poor man, when he had the attack and lost his breath in the living room, I realized what you meant when you said that the slightest shock could prove to be fatal. Exactly. The slightest shock. His bell. I must go. Yes. We wouldn't want anything to, bad to happen to him, would we? Whether it even included me in his will. I didn't think he even noticed me. And you must have received two surprises to find out that you'd inherit a million dollars and then immediately discover it was being taken away. Three surprises, actually. Now you're wealthy again. Well, Mr. Starkweather, I was thrilled to be even receiving $50,000. With that, I could go to college like you and get a good education. You could do anything you want to do, Nancy. What do you want to do? I, I don't know. I haven't been thinking about myself much. Who has been on your mind, Nancy? I, I... Jordan Starkweather, perhaps? You're very fond of him, aren't you? Who told you that? Cousin Jordan himself, actually. He said you might even be willing to, uh, kill Frank. <coughs> he what? How could he say such a thing? Well, Nancy, don't cry. But now you see what Jordan's really like. He's out for himself. He'll trample anybody who gets in his way. I guess I knew that. Minerva even tried to warn me. I even heard him propose to Miss Collins. She turned him down and later laughed about it when she told her friend Miss Van Zandt. I was taking fresh towels to the guest bedrooms when I heard him talking. You think Jordan is bad? But Miss Collins is just as bad as he is. <laughs> Those soulful gazes might work on some young innocent thing like that made Nancy, but he learned Quick enough that I'm no pushover. <laughs> I, I wish I'd been there to see it. It's about time Jordan met, Jordan met his match. I could tell Nancy about some of the mates who worked here before her. His Playboy days will be over soon enough, though. What do you mean? As of now, Mr. Starkweather has given Jordan, as well as Fiona, Paula, and young Simon a generous allowance. Once he passes on, the $50,000 bequest will be the last they receive of the Starkweather fortune. They'll have to learn what it's like to work for a living. <laughs> <coughs> Simon will do fine. He's almost out of school. But the others? They'll blow through their money in no time. And then what are they going to do for work? Can you imagine Paula sitting behind the desk of a car rental agency? <laughs> or Jordan driving the cars out of the lot for the customers? <laughs> and what will Fiona do? Sell Avon? <laughs> Can I get anything for you, Fiona? Perhaps a glass of water? No, dear, I'm fine. Mr. Davis, I wanted you to know that my Jordan couldn't have done what, oh dear, was done to Uncle Simon. He was with me in my room all evening. Now, you know that can't be true, Mrs. Stoker. <coughs> Your son told us himself that he was outside, and you were in here earlier with Bensonhurst and Miss Withers. Oh, maybe it was the night before he sat with me. <laughs> maybe it was. Now I know why Jessica Fletcher never believes the suspects on murder she wrote. It's so easy to get confused. <laughs> Concentrate on tonight, Mrs. Starkweather. Did you see or hear anything suspicious? Suspicious? Well, I saw Uncle Simon with that horrible thing around his neck. I'd call that suspicious, wouldn't you? Mike means before that, Fiona. Before? Let me think. I don't know if this is the type of thing you mean, but... Yes, continue. It was after we heard about the will and had all gone upstairs. I was passing the secretary's door when I heard her and the housekeeper inside. They were talking quite loudly, so I couldn't help but overhear. <clears throat> what are you doing in my room, Mrs. Trent? I was checking all of the guest bedrooms to make sure there were extra blankets in each. I suppose you're very pleased with yourself, Miss Collins. Why do you say that? It all worked out just as you planned. 
What do you mean? I think you do. Those magazines you brought from town, you left them lying around the house where Mr. Starkweather would see them, you've done it for months. What magazines? Those magazines and scientific journals you brought from town, left them lying around the house, they all have one thing in common. Articles about cloning. I didn't realize it until tonight, but now it's obvious what you've been doing. You planted it in Mr. Starkweather's head to clone himself. What if I did? There are no laws against sharing ideas, are there? I suppose your lawyer friend would say no, since you're in this together. That doesn't mean it's right. I think what you're planning to do is hideous. To be perfectly frank, I couldn't care less what you think. Get out. Starting to give orders already, are we? I'll leave. But remember one thing, young woman. You're not Queen Bee yet. And you won't be until Mr. Starkworth's name is on the dotted line. Assuming that ever happens. Cassie <coughs> told me about Mrs. Friend's accusations. That she engineered the cloning business, possibly with my help. Apparently, Mrs. Starkweather reported the conversation accurately, which is something of a surprise. Is it true? Did you and Kathy really give Grandfather the idea to clone himself? Even if we did, we weren't breaking any laws. Don't you agree, Mr. Davis? No laws that I can think of. <laughs> <laughs> In that case, shouldn't we focus on the law that was broken? I'm referring to the murder, of course. You're right as usual, Miss Van Zandt. Can you volunteer any information that might help us? I will tell you this. Earlier this evening, I was going to the kitchen to ask Minerva for a pot of coffee. It was apparent that Kathy and I would be working late, and I felt the caffeine might help us stay awake. Minerva wasn't there, but Regina was. I heard her talking to Mrs. Starkweather. Their conversation was very peculiar. Good heavens, Regina! What are you doing with that hatchet? I brought it in from outside to dry it off, and I sharpened it up, but you don't want to see. Goodness, no! Put it away! Maybe you will write before a horse someone, or even kills them. That's a horrible thought! <coughs> Isn't it though? I get those sometimes. Do you? I... I... Um, I see you still got your poison pills. Did you tell this isn't a poison? It's a stimulant. You just have to make sure not to take too many. <laughs> you had a lot more when I saw you earlier. Oh, I hope you didn't go an overdose. I can figure out how to do CPR. If you bring those hands any close to us, we'll grab that hatchet and chop them right off. He's <laughs> just trying to help me, Mrs. Starkweather. Well done. That awesome face is worse than death. I assure you, however, that I am fine. I just dropped a few of my pills in the living room and wasn't able to find them all. I hope Minerva doesn't find any. She thinks it's Mr. Stark with his meals, you know, and she's mighty mad at him right now. What are you suggesting? <coughs> oh, nothing. <coughs> Did you need something from the kitchen? Can you see if Minerva had any of those delicious sauce de boules left over? Oh, I can go look for you. Never mind. I seem to have lost my appetite. Mr. Starkweather's meals. What do you want to know about him? Who did he die with? Did he eat the same thing as everyone else? Mr. Starkweather was on a very restricted diet. Low salt, low fat. So I had to prepare, prepare his meal separately. What do you want to know about the food? Do you think there's something wrong with my cooking? You're a great cook, Minerva. That leg of lamb you served tonight was wonderful. <laughs> yes, well, I've often been told I have terrific legs. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, changing the subject, do you remember who gathered in the kitchen with candles when the lights went out? Before I got there, I mean. The blackout. Let me think. I was in the mansion checking supplies for breakfast. When it went dark, it took a moment to get candle from pocket and light it that Miss Trent gave me. <coughs> Minerva? Nancy? Is everyone all right? I'm here. I'm okay. I was up. I was outside when I saw Westport. I was in my room when everything went dark. What happened? I 
Because the horse forgot to pay like that. <laughs> Keep that up and I'll forget to pay your wages. What in the blazes is going on? Apparently the storm knocked out the power. My candles did come in handy, you see. Remind me to give you a gold star later. Bensonhurst, can't you get that electricity back on? That's exactly what I came to find out, Mr. Bensonhurst. The circuit breaker is right over here. I hope they hurry. I don't like the dark. Was that fast enough for you? I'm going back to my chores now. What did she come inside for? That the idiot dropped water all over a clean floor. Why Mr. Starbrook doesn't fire, I will never know. <laughs> Should be enough to pinpoint a murderer, but I just wish I had more. It could take weeks to get the results. If that new will is probated and the murderer gets his or her inheritance before then, they could disappear for good. You can easily enough buy a new identity for a million dollars or more. There must be some way I can nab the guilty party tonight. I was just really hoping that questioning the suspects would give us more information on what exactly happened, you know? <sighs> Me too. They were so busy trying to make each other look guilty, they didn't reveal much about themselves. Sometimes even the slightest... Simon, move your feet. What is it? Here, on the rug. I think it's... Yes! What they were doing was so insignificant, I hardly noticed it at the time. Simon! I know who murdered your grandfather. Who? I'll tell everyone as soon as I gather the evidence. Quickly, go tell Bensonhurst I need to see everyone in here immediately. <coughs> yes, sir. Oh, Minerva sent me to see if you'd like a pot of coffee. Scratch that. Go upstairs and tell everyone to come down here immediately. Yes, sir. Well, I don't think the police chief will mind if I use sandwich bags to gather the evidence. <laughs> I don't think he'll mind very much at all. Come in, everyone. Please take a seat. It's very late, Mr. Davis, or very early, depending on how you look at it. If someone else is going to ask, I will. Why did you call us together at this hour? It has been a long night, hasn't it? I'm sure you're all very tired. I know I am. But. I felt you would all rest easier knowing who you <coughs> murdered Simon Starkwell. You mean you discovered who killed Great Uncle Simon? I believe I have, as I'm going to show you in the next few minutes. I'm amazed, Mike. How'd you do it? First, I had to find the answer to a question that had bothered me from the beginning. It would have been so easy to make it look like Simon Starkweather died of natural causes, <coughs> a suggestion Jordan made to Miss Withers. For example, Fiona or her son could have given him some of her digitalis to trigger a heart attack. So could any of you who were here earlier and knew that she had left several of them lying on the couch when she spilled them earlier tonight. Miss Withers could have injected an air bubble into his bloodstream with a hypodermic needle. Any of you could have stolen the needle from her room and done the same thing. <coughs> it's also probable that many of you considered frightening the old man to death. Minerva with her knife, Regina with her hatchet, Bensonhurst with his wrench, Miss Thompson with her gun. The possibilities are endless. Why then did the murderer decide to take the blood pressure cuff, put it around his neck, and inflate it until he's strangled to death? Why? The answer is so obvious, I feel foolish for not realizing sooner, what must have really happened. Might one ask what that is? Obviously, when the cuff was put around his neck, Mr. Starkweather was already dead. <laughs> Isn't that right, Ms. Van Zandt? What? what? You really are clever, Mr. Davis. <laughs> it had to have been you. You were in here with me when the lights went out. 
I went to find Bensonhurst, and you went to check on Mr. Starkmother. His murderer must have just killed him and slipped into Miss Withers' room moments before you found the body. That's what I figured, too. But why would you put the cup around his neck? As our able detective here has surmised, the murderer made it appear as though Mr. Starkweather had had a heart attack. Death seemed to have, indeed, been due to natural causes. There was no doubt in my mind, however, that someone in this house had killed him. I knew that under the circumstances, the coroner would have no reason to perform an autopsy on the body, nor would the police conduct an investigation. I wasn't about to let my employer's murderer get away scot-free. I noticed the blood pressure cuff on the bed, placed it around his neck, and inflated it before wheeling him into this room. And your plan worked. No one would question the fact that he had been murdered. So Mr. Simon hired Mr. Davis to find the killer? Which I have. It was very naughty of you, Miss Van Zandt. For a while, your little ploy distracted me from the main problem. Instead of wondering who did it, I kept on wondering why did they do it that way. Once I solved that piece of the puzzle, the rest came easier. I'm sorry, Mr. Davis, but if you have discovered the identity of the murderer, then the ends seem to have justified the means. I believe the police will agree with you, and might even overlook the fact that you're guilty of tampering with evidence at the crime scene. If not, I'm on very good terms with the local judges. Wait a minute. How do we know Miss Van Zant didn't kill Great Uncle Simon herself? No motive. <laughs> Oh, yeah. Don't keep us in suspense, Mike. Tell us who did kill Mr. Starkweather. I'll do better than that. I'll show you. Bear with me. What's going on? What? Stay seated. Now, I'm sure all of you still have the candles that Mrs. Trent passed out earlier tonight to keep with you in case of a blackout. If you would, take them out, please, and light them. Mr. Starkweather's body, I found what I first thought were a few drops of blood on his bathrobe. Upon closer inspection, they had turned out to be another substance entirely. I forgot about them for the moment. As I was interrogating you individually, I noticed one of you scraping one thumbnail against the other. At the time, I took it to be a nervous gesture. I guess you could say it was nerves triggered by guilt as it turned out. I didn't realize the significance of this gesture until I recalled Minerva's testimony. She reminded me of those of you who gathered in the kitchen with candles when the lights went out. A few minutes ago, I found these on the floor by the sofa, and I had the connection I needed to find out who murdered Simon Starkweather. Thin scrapings of red tallow. Tallow from the killer's thumbnail. Tallow that matched the drops on Simon Starkweather's body. Tallow from the candle the murderer was holding when she murdered Simon Starkweather. Tallow from the one red candle among you which you are holding, Minerva Walker. I thought that was me. It's never like something other than this. There aren't. I remember thinking that when we took them down after Christmas last year, they would have to buy some more red ones for next year. Is this all the evidence you have to offer the police? Is this candle? No. I have more evidence than that. I just examined Mr. Starkweather's body. As I was walking about the room, I glanced at everyone's wrists. I noticed there were, very, there were several very thin scratches on your wrists that came from Mr. Starkweather, no doubt, as he was struggling for his life. I'll bet my reputation that these skin samples I was able to scrape from under his fingernails came from you. It'll be easy enough to prove. I've met quite a few experts on DNA testing in the last six months. Bravo, Mr. Davis. Well? I don't consider those who 
think it was not exhausted because it was in only a prison, would you? I didn't think so. Well, Ms. Van Zandt, I guess biggest mistake was trying to cross lawyer. I might have caused you to lose access to Mr. Stark and Mr. Spillings, but you definitely got your revenge. Why don't you tell us what happened? I might as well. You figured out the main details anyway. I was furious with Mr. Stark for building up hopes and dashes into the ground. I thought Van Zack rule doesn't deserve you. I listened at his door to the hallway and slipped inside when I was sure he was alone. He was sitting in his wheelchair, still awake. I went to him, gripped the handles of his wheelchair, and he ran down into his face. I told him I thought he was planning to do his monsters. I told him he didn't deserve to live. I told him I was going to kill him. Then I reached for his throat. <laughs> He was terrified. He reeled backwards in his chair and slammed into a bedside table. The impacts of the reading lamp crashed into the ground and pitched up water on top of it. When the water hit the reading lamp, it short circuited and blew the circuit breaker. So you didn't cause the blackout deliberately? No. It nearly ruined everything. But I had candle and matches in my pocket. <coughs> I managed to light the candle and hold it with one hand while I grabbed the oxygen mask off his chair with the other. I clamped the mask down hard over his nose and mouth. He couldn't breathe, of course. He made people attempt to fight back with one hand, while he raised that bed with the other. But all he could manage to do was make small, insignificant <coughs> scratch marks on my wrist. As you noticed, that and caused me to spill those candle wax drops on his robe. I'm not sure if he died of suffocation or heart attack. But it was all over in seconds. The old man couldn't do much, but I guess it was enough to pin his murder on me. And then? I put the mask back on the chair, blew out the candle, put it in my pocket, and slipped through connecting door to Miss Wizard's room. Her back was to me. She had just managed to find candle and was lighting it. I got a brass candle stuck off your bureau and struck her with it. She fell to the ground and her candle went out. I suppose this was when you were turning my parent natural death into apparent murder. Miss. <coughs> I slipped from her door into the hallway. A few moments later, he was calling a screen. I joined the rest of you as you ran in here. Then you must have been as shocked as everyone else when you saw the blood pressure cuff around his neck. I was, but what could I do? It was easy to gasp when Miss Van Zandt had called. I would have loved to take me to it for ruining everything. But I didn't try, of course. Until now, don't anybody move! Calm down. If you don't want to do anything, you might regret. It's too late for that advice, Mr. Davis. Get up. You're coming with me. Where can we go? The bridge is washed out. I know where phone and three is Simon mentioned. Simon, throw the car keys on the table. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> never get away. I think I might. All the phones are spread out and your car is on the side of the stream. It will take you hours to walk the town and notify police. By then, I'll be long gone. What about me? I would have committed perfect murder if you hadn't interfered. What do you think I'm going to do with you? Not a thing if I can help it. Ah! Hold it right there. Are you alright? I'm fine. You hurt me! Consider it a preview of the afterlife. Always keep a pair of these with me. Never know when cuffs will come in handy. What's happened? Mike. Remind me to pay you a big bonus. No problem. Well, you're going to be spending a long, long time behind bars. What do you have to say for yourself? Well, there's one good thing. Somebody else can cook for change. <laughs> <laughs>
I'm sorry about this, but I'd better see what it's all about. It's from Mr. St. John. He says he just came to from a drug-induced coma. And when he awoke, a fantastic solution to the plague was crystal clear. Yes. Yes, that's brilliant. This new ending is unbelievable. Better than any of the possible conclusions you could have come up with before. You simply have to see it. It'll take a few minutes for me to go over the changes from the past, but I'm sure they can handle it. Oh my. Really. <laughs>